as David said, uh, uh, we didn't plan this to be on on the uh, Oscars night, uh, but thank you all. You are the hardest of hardcores to be here, and we're just super, super excited to have not only Britta tonight, uh, who's just an absolute rock star uh, of a fly tiring guy, but also our old friend Johnny King. Uh, just can't wait for the discussion. Um, and um, thanks to all of you for being here. As for those of you who've been here, um, welcome back. For those of you for whom this is a new uh, forum, um, just a very quick word about Masters of the Fly. Uh, David and Eric Shasker, who's not here tonight, and, and I started this um, uh, when COVID uh, first um, uh, appeared on our shores, and we were looking for a way to stay in touch with uh, like-minded anglers and fellow fly fisher folk, and discovered through the powers of technology and Zoom that we could create a really vital community uh, of, of people and, and share ideas about fishing and fly tying and, and conservation. And it's really taken off thanks to all of you. And we are committed to continuing to do this as long as people are interested. It will always be free. We're super excited to have you here. And we're really honored to have um, incredible, incredible rock stars of fly fishing like Britta, Johnny, uh, and many others um, volunteer their time. So thank you to everybody who's uh, participated in this. Um, if we could maybe just put the slides up, Tom, for a second, I just wanted to make sure that we were uh, highlighting the uh, schedule for the rest of the season. We are now uh, at the, the halfway mark of uh, our 2023 season. We have um, uh, three more sessions, March 26th with Steve Ramirez and Ted Williams um, about um, really the, the storytelling behind the fly angling adventures that we all love so much. Uh, April 16th, um, another night of incredible fly time with uh, Gunnar Bramer. Um, you know, we had uh, Bob Popovics on, really the, the father of, uh, grandfather of, of, of big flies, um, big bait flies. Uh, we had Johnny, uh, we had Jason, uh, we have Britta. Uh, and in many respects, Gunnar has sort of adapted um, that whole philosophy and approach to fly tying uh, for big uh, freshwater species as well, as well as saltwater species. So really excited about that session on the 16th. And then on the 30th, uh, we have a session with Mark Zadati, um, who's an expert uh, flycaster, champion flycaster, competition flycaster, great all around fly angler and a really good friend of ours uh, with Gear Fisher, who's the innovator behind the OnForm uh, mobile app uh, that was really invented to, to help folks understand um, through video analysis, how to um, improve in their, their sports uh, activities uh, like golfing and pitching, but we've been applying it to fly casting and that'll be a really fun uh, final session of the season where we'll ask all of you to submit your own videos of your fly casting and we'll use that and analyze that using the OnForm app. So in, in um, lieu, we'll have to put our side by side up there just to you know laugh about yeah, our difference. For sure, uh, Mar yeah. uh, 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 David and I spent a, 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 an afternoon or morning playing with it ourselves and just learned a ton about our own techniques, just comparing our own uh, our own casting using the OnForm app. So hope you'll all join us for that last uh, session. Um, and with that, um, the only other thing I wanted to mention is logistics. Again, for those of you who've been on this before, you know this. For those who are new, uh, please, uh, you all have access. And let's make sure we turn that on, Tom and Clay. Um, we, we, you all have access to the, the chat box. Feel free to chat uh, amongst yourselves with us uh, throughout the event um, tonight. And then any questions that you have for Britta, and for Johnny or for any of us, put them in the QA box as well. Uh, you can access that by just scrolling down to the bottom of your screen. You'll see a, a, a little um, uh, a button for Q&A and for chat. Um, and we look forward to your uh, interactions throughout the evening. Yeah. So with that, let me turn it over to you, David. Yeah, and uh, Lou, Lou, that was nice of you to want me to uh, put my information up, but you know, people can just go to davidblinken.com and they'll be able to find me. Um, um, again, before I do this, 
email us here at Masters of Fly. We'll send you one or more of these if you want them. Um, so um, about three months ago, Lou and I were trying to figure out all the guests we we're going to have on the show, maybe longer. And, and Britta's name came up, and I had no idea how to get in touch with her. So um, I called one of our Masters of the Fly, Fly guests from last year, uh, Heather from from Mas from uh, United Women on the Fly, and there it was. Uh, I got an intro to uh, to Britta, who was kind enough to join us, and I'll let John embellish about Britta more, Johnny. And then Johnny, who I've known for 30 years, is one of our originals. And and uh, and he he's tied with us and uh, and been on some of our shows like Bob Popovics. But with that, what I what I really want to do is turn the show over to you, Johnny, right now, so you can give Britta a proper introduction. Um, and and uh, Johnny, of course, you need no introduction from this crowd. So uh, take it away. All right. Um, well, hello, everybody. Um, and I'm psyched to be here, psyched to be back as part of this podcast. But I'm really psyched to introduce you to one of my favorite people in the fly fishing industry and uh, one of my uh, favorite fly tires. Um, so it seems like a lot of people on this uh, podcast probably know who Britta is. But Britta is pretty unusual because she's been... Um, She's worked in fly shops. She's managed fly shops. She's guided people for steelhead, for sea run cutthroats. She's lived in a lot of different places. She is a, a commercial professional fly tire, and she now heads up the fly tying program at uh, Rio Products. So she's kind of seen the fly fishing industry um, from all angles. So we're psyched to have her here. And finally, and last but not least, Britt is my boss. So I recently switched over to Rio Products after having spent about 12 or 13 years with another fly company. And uh, Britt is the one who brought me over. And now I answer to her. And she's the one who tells me why my flies are all wrong and they won't sell or the materials are too complicated. So I've got an axe to grind and I will be wreaking my vengeance during the course of this podcast. But kidding aside, what's up, Britta? How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. Um, <laughs> I, I know we're we're all really eager to see you tie flies, um, but I think we'd like to talk to you a little bit about how you got into this, what some of your influences are, and all the different roles you've played in the fly fishing industry. So I know some of the other hosts have been asked this. I was asked this. How did you get into fishing and specifically tying? So my um, my family had a cabin growing up on the Stillaguamish River in Washington, which was one of the kind of big name steelhead rivers that used to have a lot of steelhead in them. Um, and so my grandfather and my dad used to go up there and we would all fish. And I basically started fly fishing around eight or so, but I never was like awesome at it. Um, but then we always also had one of the, um, the uh, steelhead advanced fly fishing for steelhead book. That was a coffee table book up there right, and it <laughs> yeah it had some patterns in it and so i begged my folks to bring me to kaufman's at the time um and i got a tying kit and then i taught myself to tie at that point when i was around 10. um and just tying was always the thing that got me more than anything and then i got more and more into fly fishing once i was able to drive legally uh, that helped a lot to be able to get around and go places and fish by myself so how did you learn to, I remember Kaufman's, right? Because all of us mm -hmm. were ordered from Kaufman's. It was in Oregon, had an incredible paper catalog. But yep. so you ordered the materials, but how did you actually learn to tie? Because it sounds to me I, like your history is kind of like mine. I totally taught myself. Did you, I, I mean, did you read, did you read books? Did you? There was you, a paper stapled, kit, like few sheets that came, how to start it and how to whip finish that came with the kit that I got. It was like right. a Thompson A or something like that. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and I went to town with that and all of them looked like absolute crap and or like a crappy version of a steelhead fly because that's really the only book I had to go off of was that one. And um, and then eventually I started buying more books from both Avid Angler in Seattle and then Kaufman's when it was out there as well. And I started going off of those. I I'm so ADD. I hate watching videos and I don't read books without pictures most times. So <laughs> um, I generally kind of would like to figure it out on my own. You'll still find that some of the ways I do things for tying aren't right. Um, 
but they work for me. So, so let me ask you something, a couple of questions. So the first flies you tied, they must've been steelhead flies, right? Because you mm -hmm. have the steel right there. Yeah. And steelhead flies have their own funny little niche in the fishing world, right? Because they're not really designed to imitate, yeah. um, imitate food the way a lot of your current flies are. So at a certain point, did you, did you sort of make the transition from tying these kind of attractor type flies, which are basically swinging to fish that aren't yeah. eating, right? They're in freshwater spawning to trying to imitate the stuff that fish eat. Yeah, well, I mean, what's funny is that initially the book had a lot on the teeny nymph because at the time, you know, teeny, everything eats a teeny nymph. So a right. lot of them were versions <laughs> of the teeny nymph, um, which weirdly didn't work as well for me. Um, but yeah, I would say that and like buggers and such, but the the true traditional steelhead stuff from that area, I actually didn't really get good at tying that stuff or start until I worked at Avid Angler. Um, and I worked with the son of Alec Jackson, who's oh, world wow. renowned for his fly tying and his steelhead tying. So it worked out really good. Alec used to come in and bring us food at lunch. And his son used to get really mad because his son was, he was a big guy and he'd bring me a Big Mac and he'd bring his son a salad. <laughs> so, so wait, so when did you start working at the Avid Angler? Was that your first sort of professional gig in the fishing world? It was, yeah, I was at the end of 2004. And what um, were you doing when you started there? I just started working there as an employee, at, you know, working the counter. And then um, at, at, a, at a certain point, did you start guiding people? I did. Yeah, it was a few years after that. And um, I hosted trips right after I started working there, but it, I didn't start actually guiding until a few years later. Um, but what, I started managing you, the shop and then guiding. And, and what were you guiding for? Uh, so you run cutthroat and then tr trout in some of the like Snoqualmie forks and steelhead trips as well. But I mean, the steelhead, it's just so tricky that it's a tough one and a long, it's a long season. So, right. so not as so much. Were you, were you guiding people spay casting, showing them how to spay cast? Yeah, and then I also used to run, um, we used to do every Sunday, we would do a, a spay clinic that was free for folks at one of the local lakes. And um, we'd have a really large turnout every week and I would run those as well. And so, so we were working on casting. Let me ask you a little bit about the sea run cutthroat fishery, because, you know, a lot of people on this podcast, including uh, yours truly, a lot of our saltwater fishing is here in the Northeast for stripers, albies, blues, smaller tuna, um, which is obviously a very different thing than what you have on, on, on the West Coast. So tell, you know, and a lot of us, I've caught tons of cutthroat trout, but, you know, on dry flies yeah. and rivers or we're swinging at trout spay. So tell us about a little bit about the sea run cut fishery you have in Washington. Yeah. So it's really unique in that you're going to see sea run cutthroat or cutthroat that actually go out to the salt water and come back. Um, they're going to be all the way from Northern California up through so Southeast Alaska. And um, it's basically sea run cutthroat. They get real big by going out and eating their heart out in the salt water of all sorts of different bait fish and then going back in to spawn in the river systems. Um, a whopper of a fish, any of the over 20 inches, those are beasts. Um, but they're out there for sure. We've definitely gotten them. They, I would say that a sea run cutthroat puts up a bigger fight than just about any trout I've ever caught in my life on, on a fly rod. Um, they just pummel it and go to town to the point of where, when you're throwing a six to eight, it, you sit there and play this fish off the reel and you bring it in. You're like, this is like a 12 inch fish. Like, I don't, <laughs> this is embarrassing, but they just go crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, what's fun about it is that they basically, none of it virtually none of it is sight casting at all. These fish, you're just blind casting all day with a five or a six weight because you don't have any issues with structure or anything like that or waves because we're in Puget Sound. I mean, there's a little bit of tide, there's, um, or waves, but there's not a ton to where you need a bigger rod or a longer rod. Are you fishing um, sand, sand flats or what, what, I mean, cause you're out in the ocean, right? You're at, are you at the mouth of the estuary? It's in, or the no, region? so it's Puget Sound. So it's like one massive estuary. The salinity on it is lower than a lot of other estuaries. It's just, um, it protects the salt water there from a lot of the major crap that you're gonna find in the ocean, which is nice. But what you do basically is there's, you know, it's everything from sand flats to, um, you're looking for structure. So like where creek mouths dump in, any points that jut out with a lot of the islands that are all over Puget Sound. Um, so bottleneck areas you want to fish, things like that. And, and you're just blind casting. 
Yeah, you're wade fishing. A lot of it's wave fishing. Um, it's weird. You'll find that you can actually uh, do better a lot of times when you're wade fishing versus if you're in a boat because those fish are all pummeling those bait fish, which are using the shores for protection. So it's really good sometimes. I mean, most people, I tell them, don't step a toe in the water until you make a few casts because a lot of times you could get big fish in six inches of water. Do you see them busting? I mean, I, you said it's mostly blind fishing, but do you see them busting up on bait? Is it like that? Like yeah. Like fish to blitzes in the fall. Do you have that kind of thing? Yeah, not to the same degree. I mean, we fished out a lot of our herring schools and whatnot. We have anchovies that come through and those guys just, you'll definitely see it with those. Um, what's the beauty of sea run cutthroat fishing is that when you're out there, the stuff, you're never going to know what you're going to get because they all eat the exact same bait fish that come in. So you're seeing everything from migratory king salmon, which can get to be 40 pounds, um, coho salmon, chum salmon, you'll get out there. People have gotten sturgeon if they wanted to up in the North Sound. Wow. Um, uh, sea run bull trout are definitely out. Um, we get those consistently in the North Sound. Um, how big how big yeah. do the bulls get i didn't even oh, know that 30 plus inches that's, um, that's a really large one but those are all skagit river fish the fish that are coming out of skagit and then going back in so so are you going to tie I, I know you've selected a couple of flies to tie are you going to tie yeah. us a pattern that you might use for sea run cuts yeah i'm going to tie up um a flat wing that we have kind of or i've kind of shortened and modified to make it work better for out by me but i'll tell you it'll work anywhere if you just substitute different colors of the flat wing. So, 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 so why don't we get started with, with the tying process? Um, I know okay. you, you're, you're comfortable talking and tying at the same time, right? I am. Yes. Yes, for sure. So it's really interesting, you know, like, how did you, how did you happen upon flat wings? Cause you know, we in the Northeast have our own way where we discovered flat wings, but how did you sort of stumble onto that style of tying? So when I started working at Avid Angler, I started working for, and uh, by the way, I'm going to start with the flat wing just to get going here for everyone. Um, I started working at Avid Angler and the guy that I started working for, the manager at the time was a guy named Nathan Keen. And he had formerly been running the fly fishing school for Orvis out in the Cape. And so he learned from Ken Abrams how to tie flat wings and then brought that technique back with him to Washington. Um, which was really nice. And so he used to, he was the first guy in the West Coast, I believe, that started doing actual tying classes for flat wings. Um, oh, it's so interesting, you know, cause you know, Kenny has sort of like a cult status here and he used yeah. to have these, he used to have these Tuesday nights in Rhode Island. I did them a couple of times and um, yeah. I haven't been in touch with him recently, but I used to email back and forth with them almost every day. And so he used to, he had a guy named Todd Murphy who's a guy to work with him. And he would get his hands on all these saddle hackles and dye them just these crazy colors. Uh -huh. um, and um, so there was, and there continues to be for all those people who still tie flat wings, almost like this obsessive search for the ultimate flat wing saddles. So where do you guys access them out there? Because because Kenny for a while was almost the exclusive source. He had a couple of stores in the Cape and the Saltwater Edge and yeah. in Rhode Island. But uh, did 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 your buddy who had worked um, on the Cape, did he bring some flat wing saddles or did you adapt some other materials? So he started ordering the RLS saddles of Kenny's into the shop. So we had a bunch of those. And then I actually found for Puget Sound, because the bait fish are smaller than you're going to find them, right. um, that you guys have on the East Coast, I found that the a lot of the Keo and the standard hairline, just basic rooster saddles work better. And then I would just dye them myself because in reality, the, um, the, the flat, true flat wing saddles, everyone was selling them. They were selling them and saying that it was like, they were like for Ken Abrams style flat wings, right? They're not for and, Puget Sound. And they were ones. super long, right? Yeah, it was like so, having a 14 inch size, 14 dry fly hackle. <laughs> this is an old RLS saddle and there's like five feathers on it, 20 maybe tops that are right. And the rest of them are all striper size. So, 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 so why don't you talk about what you just did? You just attached, you just attached a bucktail platform, right? Yeah, I just attached a bucktail platform. The thing with this fly that I'm doing is I'm going to make it a foul free version. So that would be good because flat fly. wings can saddle for sure. I mean, flat, yeah. flat wings can foul for sure. So I'm going to go ahead and tie it so that the whole fly is from the actual point back. 
So, um, and I'm doing a sand deal because they have weird long faces anyways. So it's going to work out fine and look good. Um, plus I get to use my pen to color it later when I want to. So that's always fun. <laughs> right, because fish um, won't eat it unless you color it with a pen, of course. Oh, of course not. The beauty of this though too, is that you don't actually, a lot of times um, the original recipes are going to call for something like a um, platform feather, right? You're going right. to stream your neck upside down. Yes. You don't have to do that with this because it's not going to foul. Because um, Okay, so you're going to show us, you're going to do something with it. So right now, and is your bucktail, it, I can't quite tell from the image, is your bucktail attached just to the top of the hook or did you have it surround the hook 360? It's just to the top. So this is going to just add a little bit to keep them upright. It's not necessarily going to do anything because I want to keep that slim profile. It's not going to do anything to really keep it from fouling if it wants to. Um, they just hopefully should do that on their own. And, and what, um, kind of, what kind of thread and hook are you using? I forgot to ask you when you started. So right now, I'm just using Danville 140 denier. Um, okay. I tie virtually everything with white. I do like the Vivas, whatever it is, the GSP. But on flat wings, it cuts through that the membrane of the feather, and it likes to kick it up a little bit. And so it makes yeah. it really hard to do that. And it's slippery, um, yeah, too. Yeah. The other thing that I found that's really nice is that when you're tying flat wings, everyone knows that, and Kenny will tell you too, that if you don't tie the feather in correctly, it's gonna foul no matter what. It doesn't matter how much glue and crap you add to it, it's gonna foul. Um, right, right, right. So this isn't to help that, but this does add durability. So like for client flat wings, um, I kind of like to say, it's like Elaine on Seinfeld with her sponges, only this is like me saying whether or not they're not sponge worthy, they're flat wing worthy. So like once <laughs> clients out there on the beach have proven their flat wing worthiness and their casting, then I'll go ahead and I'll give them flat wings to use. Right, right, right. Um, but this stuff, this is the bone dry uh, UV Solaras, Solaras, depending on who you talk to. This stuff absorbs it immediately. And it so it's adds thin, right? Durability. That's one of the thin, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's one of the thin ones, right? It's that, the thinnest one out there. Um, and it just, you basically just want to put a drop of it right on the end on the base of your um, feather and then everyone's gonna get blinded. Sorry, I got like the mother of all lamps and what here. Kind of, what kind of light are you using? It looks like it's a loon light maybe. It's the loon, the big one. Um, right. I don't freaking know. They're all, I swear they're all the same, um, but there are some that are, that do um, solidify stuff way faster. Right. I think this one's really good and I really like it, but I wish it had more of a focus in the middle to like really hammer stuff and it doesn't as much as I'd hoped. And like, um, what size, is that like a size six or four hook? Or yeah, this one's, a, well, this is a four, but it's the SL12S short shank. Um, yeah, right. So these, these guys end up looking way tinier than they actually are. Right. Uh, so next yeah. up I'm going to use, because it's a sand lance and ours are pretty, kind of dark at times. I'm going to actually use some of the, this is the Senyo's Predator Wrap. Oh, right. That's kind of, is, are you using the modeled stuff or the single Yeah. Stuff? This is just the modeled stuff. Yeah, it's very cool. That out. Yep. Um, so I'm going to do that. Then I'm going to add in some more feathers because why not? You know, I, so I have, so I, have a, I think I know the answer to this question, but you know, so we fish, one of our most important baits for for Northeastern fish is what we call a sand eel, but it's also a sand lance too. And yep. I think I think that the Pacific and Atlantic sand eels are, or sand lances, whatever you want to call them, are pretty close. Um, yep. I sort of looked into this and we get them anywhere from, you know, they could be an inch and a half long to sometimes on the Cape they'd be, um, you know, I'd see them at five inches. And then in the fall, we get a run of ocean sand eels and they might be seven yep. or eight inches long. It's almost as thick around as an eel. Do you get that range of sizes? Yeah, we do. We um we get on the coast. You'll see them a lot. Uh, you'll see them a lot bigger. We don't have them in Puget Sound that big. Generally, we just have them uh, like an inch and a half is probably the money size. But I mean, right, you'll right. have even with this size hook, I could get this guy to be you know three and a half inches long, four inches long, and you'll still have like a ten inch cutthroat and hail the crap out of it. So. You know, you know, one thing that's funny about sand eels, this is something I learned from just watching them for so many years at the Cape is, you know, most fish like a bunker or a shad herring, those kind of fish, it's really their tails that wiggle. But sand eels, at least our sand eels are like little mm -hmm. snakes. The whole thing 
yeah. the whole thing snakes around. So I would yep. think that the flat wing would be really good for imitating that behavior. Yes, for sure. And especially if you have any sort of a current at all that you could kind of let it undulate in the current and do that, that's, I mean, pretty much highlighting everything that you want a flat wing to do and act like. That's it in the perfect scenario right there to fish on. So, so tell us, what's your technique? Because it can be tricky to seat a feather, whether you're using a neck feather, I guess you're using saddles. But how do you get it? You want it flat, right? Concave side down and flat. You're layering Correct. saddles on top. How do you get it to sit right? Because it's very easy with one yank of thread to have it just sort of migrate to the towards you or away from you. Um, I've yeah. had many a failed flat wing in my life. <laughs> So a lot of times, um, if it's a really thick stem, I'll actually take it and I'll um, I'll flatten the stem itself. And you mean like with a needle nose plier or something? Yeah, just do that. Um, in this case, what I generally will do if they're not super fat, then what I'll do is I'll tie them in. And when I tie them in, I do one loose turn with my thread and then I do a much tighter turn and tighten on the upturn. And- you so you you mean you mean you pull up, pull hard. Yeah, I just you tighten, tighten on the th- back side and then go over. And, and why, I, does pull, why does pulling up seat it better than pulling down? Because it because it doesn't twist around as much. It doesn't pull it down immediately on that the far side. It'll end up exactly. kind of keeping it from doing that while tightening on the upside. Yeah, because I remember what Kenny used to like to do is he'd put in his his bucktail, then he'd take some fluff from the base of the feather or some dubbing, and he'd create like a little pillow, right? Yep, um, yep. And yep. he did that so that you could seat the saddle into it, but it doesn't look like you find that necessary. And what you got tied on there is oriented perfectly, right? Yeah. Maybe, you know what, I, yeah. You know what might help is could you, uh, well, I'm because of where I'm looking, I'm seeing the side view. Could you, yeah, ro- I, are you I'll able to rotate the, your vice? I, will, I'll, I can spotlight the top uh, camera. Hold on one second here. Yeah, because I, I want people to see how, because Britta's got it in there kind of perfectly. And I'd say the majority of flat wing, there you go, see, right? So you've got like the shoulders of the feather are sort of cupping over, like straddling the hook shank basically. So wait, is that one feather or two feathers? It's two, right? So we're now at three. And what have, what have the colors been? So it's been a weird light olive at the base. Then I did a pan and then there's ye- pale yellow. And okay. next up, I'm gonna do a olive variant color which which is going to be a little darker than the lower olive right correct yep so another yeah. interesting thing that i learned about sand deals i don't know um you know if this is true of yours but bob popovich pointed this out to me almost all bait fish a lot of bait i shouldn't say almost all but a lot of bait fish are translucent right like in bay anchovy will have a opaque back and but its belly you can almost see through it sand mm-hmm. deals are a little bit different you can actually the the, the olive top half the brownish olive top half of them um, yeah. It's kind of a little bit translucent, but the belly is like an opaque pearl color. So it's the only bait fish I know that kind of reverses. Do you guys have, is that true of your sand eels? Yeah, for the most part. In fact, we, um, one of the deadliest patterns for March and April is fishing <clears throat> all like dark colors. So, so basically I'll tie up sand eels in like a fuchsia cerise olive combo. Right. With zero light on them at all with the right. cerise for the throat and that seems to work really really well um but yeah we definitely see the same thing yeah because um, bob, bob, yeah. bob has a bunch of videos of bait fish swimming and it's really interesting so uh, you guys don't have silver sides silver sides are a, ba- a, a sort of a thin bait fish with a like a silver stripe along the side but when you see them yeah. swimming from the side actually sometimes all you see is a black stripe along the side nothing oh, yeah. silver yeah, oh, but with the sand eels, you tend to see you tend to see that dark back, right? It looks like a little sort of snaky olivey thing. Yeah, the water. yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, they, they're it's weird to see them at times when the we have massive tide flip changes every day. Um, it generally twice a day it can go anywhere from minus three tide to a plus thirteen. In the summer, oh yeah, that's a big change. Wow, which is great unless you like put the boat in and it's like a you know, like a six or a seven, and then you go to take it out and it's a minus three and you can't even get within 10 feet of the boat ramp. Um, or if you waited, I've done that on flats in the Cape, right? <laughs> I waited, yeah. I waited a quarter mile from shore and turned around and was like, wait, well, what happened to the sandbar? That I could yeah, totally. <laughs> it's super sketchy at times. Um, so we generally, you'll see sand eels 
um, like poking their heads out at times too, which is pretty fun when it gets really, really shallow right, on certain right. beaches. But so now I'm actually, one of the things I've started doing with some of these is adding in some of the squimpish hair. Oh, and it, you want to tell everybody cool. what squimpish hair is because they may not know. Obviously I'm familiar with it for, for it's, reasons. Um, so Dave Nelson is a genius and he sells this stuff called Squimpish Flies brands. Uh, this is actually just the Squimpish hair and it's one of the custom blends that he'll do. This is not the color I'm using. Um, I tend to be for a random crap in these bags too. Um, but you'll see he has a bunch of little olive ones, things like that in different combos. And they're pretty cool because it's kind of like an Icelandic sheep had a baby with a bucktail to a degree. So it's not quite as soft as like Icelandic sheep or snow runner, but it's really, really nice in that you can cut it and not have it look blunt. And it they're just really cool blends and it adds a little bit of length and bulk without necessarily messing up your fly. So and they also, unlike a lot of synthetics, they swim really, really well, right? Correct. So, yep. Right. So um, I found it sort of like it's like if you cross craft fur and polar bear or something like that. Yeah, um, it's like a weird little combo, but it looks really good on flies. So you're doing that like as a dorsal covering over the top black wing? I'm going to put one feather on top of that. Oh, so you're sandwiching it, it a little bit. Yeah. So it gives a little bit of bulk between two of the feathers, just a touch, but it also then I cut it the same length as I do my flashaboo, which is longer than the state last feather. Gotcha. Um, just just a little bit longer and you stagger it, I assume. You don't just kind yeah, of like tamper. You got it. And so then it allows it to give kind of that touch of that tail because they basically have the tiniest little tails. Um, so it ends up giving it that touch too of like that tail sticking out. There we go. So right now we're still right at the bend of the hook, right? You haven't progressed yep. up that hook. Yet. Nope. And this fly is actually already almost done. I'll show you in a second here when I finish it. Let me ask somebody about the sea run cuts. Like, so for instance, for stripers, right? You could you could tie a 14 inch fly and have the hook in the first half inch of the fly. And totally. they always hit they always hit it head first. Like yep. I know Same trout deal. and rivers, that's not always the case. Do you find that the sea run cuts hit these flies head oh, first? Yeah. yeah, only because they're used to fishing for bait fish that are in schools. Like all those fish are gonna do that because they need to be able to pick out one fish out of the whole school. And in doing that, they have to hit for the eyes, right? So you it's generally want because they off. don't do that because they don't do that in rivers, right? Like you can get no. cutthroat nipping at you the tail of your woolly book. Yeah, that's why people are always asking, saying that they claim that they need to have bait fish with stingers and whatnot for the rivers. And I'm like, yeah, you definitely do um, for a lot of them. But the, out in the sound, the only things that are lazy like that tend to be coho. So coho will definitely short strike. Um, but the rest of the fish that are out there, they'll always hit for the head. So you just want prominent eyes on them. And so what happens if you're fishing one of these flies, you got your little six weight out and then a king hits it? Like, what do you do? It's um, like sheer chaotic hell for like 15, 20 minutes. Um, it usually involves a lot of swearing and yelling and running up and down the beach. Right. Um, the beauty of it is, is as long as you actually let it run, which they do a lot, um, you can do okay and you, you'll be able to bring them in eventually. But it's a shit show to say it nicely. <laughs> and the same um, thing with the so same thing with the cohos. Do they like take you for a ride on these things? Oh yeah. So five percent of our um, coho and king salmon actually never leave Puget Sound. So even when the fish aren't traditionally you know running like you would normally think of um, in the river systems or coming in to go into the river systems, we still year round can fish for these fish because they're always out there. They're, they just don't go out to the Pacific. That five percent of them, so they don't get as big. Um, so our sea run cut or um, sea, sorry, our sea um, coho, we call them our resis, our resident coho. Right. And then we have blackmouth, which are our resident king salmon that don't go out to the Pacific. And they're like little footballs. Those things eat awesome and they fight awesome and they're just a blast to go for. And so you, you can just catch them like as, you can, are you targeting them or are you catching them like as bycatch oh, yeah. when you're looking for the cuts? Yeah, no, you get both really. Um, you tend to get more of the migratory fish once summer starts, but until then you can definitely target them and do quite well because they tend to hang around in schools, a lot of them. So where you find one, you're going to find a lot. So what are you doing now? So, so I, so your tail assembly is done, right? Like My tail got... assembly is done. Yeah. So now all I'm doing is going to tie in a tiny bit of 
uh, hair for the throat of it. Okay. What, what is that stuff? It's bear. Bear. <laughs> legal. It's legal bear. Right. Um, and, and I will say, Britta does traffic in all kinds of illegal uh, uh, animal and feather parts because I've received some of them. So she's a criminal, but you know. Um, <laughs> so, but you could use you could use fox fur or anything like that, right? You just need like a Correct. tiny little bit of white. That's just to give you a little white on the underside. It's only to give me a little bit of white on the underside. And honestly, you can use anything. You can use Senyo's laser dub if you want or oh, yeah, similar. Because cool, that's really translucent. Yeah. Now when all I'm doing is just trying to make it look a little bit prettier all the way up to the front. And then so I'm are you gonna tapering color. it? Are you making it kind of like pointy and triangular, like a sand deal nose? Yeah, which I mean, in reality, doesn't need it. No, it's probably just for me, but I still like doing it. And again, this is my favorite tool on the planet. So in case you guys didn't know, I love cauterizers. They make me so happy. Um, it's that so should, much fun. I, yeah. That I should concern everywhere. anyone who knows you that you love cauterizers, but you know. Give yourself well, some well, prison tattoos if you get bored. Well, well, fly tires are weird, right? Like I, I'm in love with my fly tank. Hey, right. Britta, can, oh, you, yeah. <laughs> can you explain to folks what the cauterizer does? Because I'm not sure a lot of our tires know how to use that. Yeah, um, so it just burns things. So it's like, it's going to burn anything it touches, and it's going to get really, really, really hot. As you can see, probably it's red. Um, so you can touch it to different things. If you do a really messy job with the eye of your fly, you can burn it with this. Um, back when I used to tie it Avid Angler, I would... And Alec Jackson would come in. I'd show him with all the pride and out there, um, like chronomids I tie. And he would take a cauterizer to it and just run it down the side. And if it lit up and smoked at all, he'd be like, nope, not going to work. That's because awesome. I left some sort of little fuzz or tag or something and just crushed <laughs> me. But in hindsight, it's, I mean, I needed it. Um, but yeah, this, this thing is great. And it makes it so that um, you could actually take them too if you spin deer hair. I mean... If you spin deer hair really well, the hat's off to you because it sucks. Um, but you can actually take this and you could burn out little holes for the eyes to put 3D eyes in and glue them in and stuff. Um, so there's a lot of options. The annoying part is, is you don't want to cut your thread because I've done that too. <clears throat> so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to quick whip finish and then we're going to do some coloring and then we're going to add eyes. So one of my favorite things is Copic markers. These oh, things, are those, those things are my favorite. Great. And they last forever too, which is really nice. So I'm going to add an olive to this um, thread so that I, and then I'm going to add my eyes to it. Yeah, those markers, especially the pointy ends, right? Sometimes they have, they come with two ends, a pointy end. I don't know if yours is like that. But, yep, um, I use this one the most. It's funny, I use, the pointy, pointy end, I yeah. use the pointy one, not the wedge one, but they have yep. all kinds of great tans and golds and olives and rusts. And oh yeah. I tend to get really excited about the coloring aspect of it almost so much that it's super nerdy because I don't think like Does no fish is gonna just, give a crap. Right, so, yeah. so, so you're, you're concerned about, about in, admitting to being nerdy after you just told us that your favorite thing in the world is a color. Oh yeah, that's true, <laughs> good point. Just pause and think about that for a minute. So wait, so you're saying, one thing I've noticed about sand eels is the eyes are right, you know, it always bugs me when people put the eyes right behind the hook eye because they're set back a little bit, right? Yep. So okay. this is actually going to look more realistic. Yeah, um, exactly. That's what I mean. So what I'm going to do is first, I'm going to touch it a touch with this bone dry stuff right in between so that these guys aren't. Did you glue them on at all or did you just stick them on with the stick them on the eyes? No, I'm lazy as hell. I'm not going to glue anything if I don't have to. I'm going to UV it every time and then I'll go back over with the UV. Um, and then I, what I will do is I will coat the whole thing. I don't care how good of a light you have. You need to coat the whole thing. Oh, this one didn't even stay on there, but it will. Um, coat the whole thing with Sally Hansen's or something similar. You mean to get, you're gonna, to get rid of the stickiness? Yeah. Yeah, or you're going to end up with that polymer left on there, and it's going to be really annoying. Um, Stick break out my other flybacks, right? Yeah. This eye is being a pain in my butt right now. So would you fish this typically like on a floating line, an intermediate line, using shooting heads? I'm just curious. 
So this one, I would fish with a, like a full floater or I would fish with a intermediate head, like the outbound short. Right. Um, Just, do you use yeah, stripping baskets out lot. there? Do you, guys use, do you guys use stripping baskets on your beaches? Oh yeah, we use the same ones. The old LL Bean is one of my favorites Then line yeah, curve. Yeah. Yeah, that was the best one. Yeah, and I mean, it's funny because every once in a while I get somebody out there they get all excited and they show me it and they have, they'll drill holes out. And for Puget Sound, you cannot do that at all because it lifts all the line up and just tangles it all around. Um, exactly. Just because we have to wait out so deep too. Um, so it's just, you don't want to do that. Yes. Me nuts, so we, but... we put the holes in. If you're fishing a, a beach where you're getting splashed all the time, you need holes in it. Oh yeah. But if you're sure. fishing any kind of flat or calm water, I never use holes, right? Because you want it to float up on the water and not totally. have the water in there swash, swishing all the line around so yeah that's such a cool looking uh, uh sand eel and it just would swift there's like nothing to it right it's so sparse yeah it's very very sparse um and these work really the style of um foul free works really good for you can do it um with like ep fiber instead of a flat wing and tie it really big and bulky for the body for like a herring or smelt or similar um right, right, right. And you can get do that. You can also get away with tying um, pinfish and or needlefish. Um, yep. Work really well like this too. Um, I've tied cuda flies like this with a stinger. Um, excuse my computer for reminding me of this actual program right now. Um, so you could tie, you know, all sorts of stuff. And then I'm going to cut that flash of you about an inch and a half longer than the rest of the fly. So this is like basically your sort of platform for a long slender bait fish, right? You got it. Yep. Right. Yep. And if you want something like this and you want, if it's really thin water and they're in really shallow water. Yeah. Um, then I'll tie some like this with uh, jungle cockeyes, just because yeah. that's probably one of the thinnest profiles with no weight at all you could get. Right. Um, but in reality, these work just fine. And just going with like one size, the smaller eyes is probably what I also do a lot of times. This one's a little bit bigger, but yeah. So it's a great you, just, just to review, you had a bucktail platform, then you had two or three saddles, then you had squimpish, and then you had one saddle on top of it. Was that the sequence? Did I get it right? Yeah, there's, <clears throat> there's four feathers on here total. Right. There's olive yellow or olive tan yellow and then olive variant. And then I have the senyos on it. I have some uh, mid flash, and then I have some of the uh, swimpish hair. But you were pretty sparse with the flash, right? You didn't put big, mm -hmm. thick hair, right? You were just doing a few yeah, no. each, right? Yeah, I know. I think Kenny says two total, right? right? He, yeah, but he, which I don't he abide used, by. But do you remember he used to tell you to count, count out the bucktails? He'd say like 15 years oh, of totally. blue bucktail. And, yeah. and yes, I did. And yes, I did do it. And after a while, I gave it up. <laughs> Yep. So, um, uh, well, that's that's such a cool fly. So um, let's switch to, I think we'll have time for another pattern. Let's switch to another yep. pattern since um, just just while you're, while you're setting up, other than Kenny Abrams, um, who are some of your tying influences? If you have them, you know, like I know there's certain people who really mm -hmm. influence how I tie from books and from meeting them. So I'm kind of curious yeah. who they for you. Well, one of them is obviously is you, um, for sure, which I think we should probably tell the story about how um, we got you with Rio for tying. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it, it, it actually shows the absurdity of my professional life, but go ahead. Yes. So, so for those of you who don't know, obviously, um, Johnny is also a lawyer. Um, and we had, <clears throat> when we were starting to look into signature tires for Rio, we wanted people that only they had a large portfolio of fly patterns and we only wanted, you know, under 20 people, ideally total. So unlike a lot of the companies, including ones that I've tied as a signature for before um, that have, um, you know, hundreds of people that all have one or two patterns, we wanted people that had a lot. And the top in my list was Johnny. Um, <clears throat> the funny part is, is I went through and I kind of, um, Read, kind of went through it with everyone at the office at Sage. And we all decided, of course, unanimously, Johnny is the best. But then I found out that Johnny has been for many years, he's been the actual, the lawyer for Rio. Um, so 
the joke in the office was that we were having Johnny write up this contract for Rio to start, um, have all their signature designers sign. Um, and then we we're going to turn around and be like, okay, now Johnny, you're going to have to sign it too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that's like the ultimate funny. conflict of interest, right? I write this totally, uh, contract yeah. for, for Rio. And then of course, when I have to sign it, the thing that I've drafted is that I'm not signing this exploitive, you know, <laughs> thing that's going to take advantage so much my firstborn. But yeah, I think, well, uh, f first of all, before we go off on Rio, I do want to talk a little bit about what you're doing at Rio, but tell us what you're tying and what you're starting <laughs> with. Yet. Okay. So this fly is what would normally be a pretty simple fly, but it's got a really cool technique to it <clears throat> that um, that I'm a big fan of. It's one that I actually learned from Josh Boyles, who's one of our signature tires. Yep. Um, and it involves, I have a couple flies with Rio, with the clickbait and the um, appropriately named the suppository um, <laughs> that uses technique. And it's basically taking, um, uh, junction tubing from spade tubes and shoving a rattle in it, which is where the name suppository came from. Uh, because I like to joke that if you want to replace it with a bigger rattle, you can lube it up and just shove it in more. Um, <laughs> oh my goodness. No. Um, but that said, it also means that you can remove you, you it. Don't, you yeah. don't use a cauterizer for that process. <laughs> <laughs> no, just a lot of lube. Um, but we'll sit there and it makes it so that you can, not everyone wants to rattle, or if you break the rattle at some point, slamming it onto a rock, especially for like red fish flies and things like that, you can take it out or you can replace it. So are, um, you, are you just tying the little junction tubing off the bend of the hook? All I'm going to do is tie it in like that. It's going to get covered up by other stuff and no one's going to know it's there, but the fish, hopefully. So, um, so let, me, let me just tell you something interesting about that. I have a, a bucktail deceiver that Bob Popovic tied me probably about 12 or 13 years ago and it's got tubing off the back of it with a little rattle in it yep. so so he would bury it in these huge like seven or eight inch really broad profile flies now you look like you have a jig hook in there. I have a jig hook that I'm using with this guy um and it's it's basically like a clouser I mean it's not going to be that exciting the technique with this is what's fun um only because if you sit there and you're finding that fish have seen they're not eating anything they've either they've seen everything there's a bunch of people out fishing for them or they're just being a little bit pickier and you've thrown everything out there at them um then why not try a rattle because you got nothing to lose at that point like what um, what, what species have you used this fly for with the rattle so we've used it for redfish um it works incredibly well for redfish um we've used it the guys have used it out in the delta and it worked pretty well for stripers out there as well um, and then I've used it for salmon out in the salt in smaller sizes and it works great. So I noticed, I noticed that somebody just put in the comments that the clickbait, which I know is your pattern, right? Is, yeah. Um, and has a rattle in it. Somebody said it works well in Jay Bay. So Jay Bay is Jamaica Bay. That's a, okay. that's a big bay we have in New York City and it actually backs up to JFK Airport. So if you go way back oh, and it, you can sit there and catch stripers and have planes flying over your head. But so oh, your fly... Your fly has migrated all the way to the dirty waters of New York City. <laughs> and Tim's saying it works nice. in hot talk as well. So clearly it's a, it's a winner all the way around. Nice. You used it in Montauk, Leanne? Uh, Tim, our, our buddy Tim O'Rourke said he, he oh, used Tim. it in Montauk. Yep. Cool. He's a great guy. I really like him. So Britta, let me ask you something. You're using a jig hook, right? But you're putting on yeah. red eyes. Do you ever, do you ever with this pattern, put a bead, a slotted bead and notch it up the little neck of the jig or you prefer the lead eyes? Yeah, um, I have, I've done both. I don't think it really, for, um, for a lot of it, I would probably prefer a bead just because of the way it's going to keep it down a little bit more. Whereas Pretty like reliable, these, it tends to be, yeah. Um, the other thing is, is that I'm also using rabbit with this. So it kind of does good to have it like that. Gotcha. Um, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, hell, you can, heck, you can use any kind of fur for the tail. Um, you can use marabou if you wanted. This is actually a really, really simple, easy pattern to, to tie. So it's kind of fun that way. So, so, so let's get back to some of your tying influences. It's nice of you to say that I'm your influence, but I think that's just because <laughs> we're working together. But are there other tires that, um, fresh or saltwater that have had an influence on, on how you tie? Yeah. I mean, Obviously, Kenny Abrams has been a big one. I love looking at, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of tires 
that are in uh that are overseas a lot of uk people guys in scandinavia are big ones oh, yes, um sure. yeah um i couldn't name many of them if i tried marcus zetterblad i believe is one of them is a really good tire exactly. um, and then Col yeah Colger, gunner Colger Brammer. Lachman. yep I'm sorry, Colger, who... uh, gunner Brammer is a huge one which we also got for rio which is pretty awesome um yeah there's there's a lot of really good ones out there that um i'm really excited about you know uh out of all points joe webster he's a great he's a great tire yep um i like him and then uh justin mcguffin is a great tire in the midwest but otherwise i just i tend every time i'm going through instagram you'll i try not to swear but i get so frustrated when i'm just like i just want to see different patterns and scroll through and then you're seeing like some chick on a boat that's like tag fly fishing or fly tying. And you're like, oh, just keep letting me go through flies. Yeah, so I, I love spending hours going through flies and seeing just some of the different patterns that people have come up with. It's pretty fun. Yeah, that's one me. of the best things. That's one of the best things for, for people complain about social media, but I have learned so much from, for instance, European tires. And then I start up a correspondence with them and I would never have known them, but for like Instagram, right? Oh yeah. So. Yeah, totally. Hey, um, Britta, yeah. two quick questions for you in the Q&A. Uh, what size yeah. rattle are you using there? So on this one, it is, I have no idea. Um, it's 100 for like $4 on, e or on Amazon. And it's the smallest size they offered. I will tell you that I'm really bad at length and distance. So I'm going to say it's, this guy's probably three quarters of an inch long at the most um half to three quarters inch probably and it's uh probably three millimeters in width got it and then i always use them with the large size of the um the large size of the uh hmh junction tubing yeah and that stuff's flexible right it's kind of stretchy yes you got it yep okay so what are you doing you're trying to slip a material um on the hook side is is that uh what material this is you just bucktail and all i'm doing is basically spinning this to prevent um any sort of fouling going on yep and so it's, right. <laughs> yep so it's it's preventing fouling so you should explain that to people why is that preventing fouling because it's pushing the material away from the hook point you got it yeah it's just going to keep that material and it's going to keep the fly line from wrapping around um, hopefully preventing it from, <clears throat> no matter how messed up casting might be on any given day, it's going to prevent it from hopefully, hopefully wrapping around the rattle. So it's more for the rattle to prevent the rattle from fouling onto something than anything else. Yeah. Cause you got a lot between the lead eyes and the rattle, which does have some weight sticking out the back. There are some, there's some snaggy things there, right? Correct. Yeah. And I mean, it would, we all, I mean, when you're out there distance casting, um, eight weights and whatnot and something heavier it never is pretty so whatever you can do to keep it from doing that helps you definitely want to use stiff bucktail though because that's going to also help you in the long run right, um, right yeah next up we're going to i'm going to put on just a touch of some red chenille just to give it a little bit of a weird red bleeding throat situation because it's fun i'm not going to put rabbit on this one after all i thought of something different midway through talking so you know what it you know what it sort of reminded me of it's sort of like a modern it, it, right now with the red throat it's kind of reminding me of a whistler like a dan blanton whistler you know he would yeah 100 like, percent, yeah right yep. so for for those of you who aren't familiar dan blanton's a great tire and fisherman he's an author he has a a website i think out in the west coast and one of his signature patterns i remember reading about it in lefty's book was um was a whistler and it was, it had lead eyes. He often got on a jig hook and he always had a red collar in the middle to imitate like bleeding gills or something. So it looks like you have a brush there or something. What's that? Yeah, I'm gonna use this um, and I'm gonna actually marry it with another brush so that it isn't quite as obnoxious, but it adds some bulk to the fly. Gotcha. Um, what are the brushes? What are they made so of? This one, it is a, it's just the standard scud dub brush, one inch here. And then right. this one is the, I think it's the flash brush. Um, it's That's, just the holographic silver. Is this so um, Enrico's or a flat? It is. H2O? Yeah, okay. I would, um, if anyone is, we have a really, really nice machine at work that we had our um, engineers design for us. And 
next to the time I tried tying, if you want to call it tying a gummy minnow, I don't think anyone's heard as many swear words coming out of my mouth as it was the day we were messing around trying to do exact versions of this. Um, <laughs> Right, because Freddie, yeah. have you, you should talk to David Nelson about that. He's kind of figured out how to do the brush thing. It's literally, I think, it's counting out exact fibers and spreading them out to do it perfectly. I mean, even with double rotation motors and everything, it is a joke. Um, so needless to say, yes, I still buy these. Um, I have made them work in situations like this because it creates bulk. It's easy, even though they're expensive as hell. Um, it's still worth it in small amounts and you could get away with using less of each by marrying them together. So I basically just match them up. Like I'd be marrying a marabou, two feathers of a marabou um, or two marabou feathers. And so I'm going to tie that in and then I'll fold them and palmer it. So while you're doing that, uh, Britt, I'm just going to shift back to one other topic. So you and I have both been associated with other commercial fly operations, right? Some of the ones that you yeah. see in there. And when I was first introduced to you guys at Rio, right, and it was a new thing because Rio is already well known for fly lines and, you know, has a corporate relationship with Sage and Reddington, seemed like you had sort of a different concept for developing a pl fly program at Rio. And I know you're responsible for a lot of the signature patterns. So how, what's the difference in the concept, right? Because like I said, you and I, most other fly companies are approaching it the same way, right? They're, they're signing up fly tires from all over the place and they might have three or 400 tires and thousands of skews. So, so how are you guys approaching it? Because I know this is, yeah. you know, this is in a lot of ways your baby and you're responsible for that. Yeah. Um, so Patrick Kilby and I work together um, and he um, manages the majority of the fly program there. And what we'll do is I'll come up with or find and he will too, different people that we think have a really large portfolio of patterns to offer. And we're approaching them instead of say with one of the other brands out there who they ask people to send in patterns of theirs. I'm not doing that. I don't wanna deal with a bunch of flies of people's. Um, not that they aren't great, they probably are, but we're specifically headhunting people ourselves to make sure that we have people that then can back up our brand. Like I don't know stripers, I know striper flies just, from knowing how to tie them and things like that and reading Kenny's books. But I definitely don't know why you would want weight distributed in certain areas. I don't know exactly when you would fish it perfectly in one area versus another. I sure as hell don't know anything about crabs for out there. So it's nice to have or people that will add credibility and sort of some form of um, just legit people that know their stuff and we'll add street cred kind of to our fly program too. So it makes it that you can have people that, um, if anyone questions and says, hey, well, why did you do this for that? I don't know if it really works. Then we could reach out to the designer and be like, hey, he knows this stuff. This guy's been guiding for decades out here. I'll find out from him and get back to you. Things like that. It makes it a lot better than me just saying, oh yeah, I designed something because I saw it online and it looked all right. And I don't know why I would fish it. <laughs> So you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's adding legitimacy more than anything to our, our program. Right, because it seems like you guys are being pretty selective and you're doing it sort of regionally, getting people in particular. Yeah, that's sector. the hope, yep. Right. All right, so you wrapped your, you wrapped your two brushes, you married them. It was kind of like wrapping two marabou feathers. And it looked mm -hmm. like what you, do, you did about, it looked like you did about maybe two wraps, three wraps, something like that. Yeah, about, sure, about that. That sounds about right. Um, okay. um, in other words, in now, other words, you don't remember. I have no idea. I'm right. I'm never. So I'm going to be the worst at that. Always. Um, now, what I'm going to do is grab a little bit of this craft fur. and I'm going to tie this in for the throat. Okay, so we're on the top of the hook shank, but the bottom of the fly for how it's going to sit, right? Correct. So this is just going to be to tying in the throat. That's all I'm doing right now on this guy. Now I'm going to trim that and then I could cauterize the crap out of it if I want or not. It's up to what I'm feeling at the moment. And you would use the cauterizer to just to trim the fuzzies that you need to, to burn yeah, off Yeah, like that stuff. I just did a crappy job of cutting in because I love cauterizers. I'm going to break it out. I don't know how you don't burn off your thread. Like... 
it's like, it's actually a lot harder than it seems. Um, the other thing that I found these are th worth their weight in gold with is if you're tying out flexos um, and you don't want to like sit there and go through 10 pairs of these by right. cutting them and you can never get, they're still sharp on the edges and whatnot. You could burn the heck out of it and then wrap immediately over with your thread. If it's a decent enough thread, um, like 140 denier, then it'll just smush it down. Like, cause it melts should, and it's awesome. You should explain to everybody what you mean by a flexos cause that's a particular material, right? It's yeah, it's crab. just, it's cable wire covering basically that they use for crabs. Started right, off it's like a mesh tubing. Yeah, it's a, um, it's kind of, I probably have some, but I'm not going to dig for it, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't have any nearby. But yeah, it's a pain in the butt to work with because it's all plastic and it's like a hard plastic webbing sheath. Yeah, that, 100 um, years ago, did you, did you know an East Coast tire? He passed away named um, Jack Guardside. He oh, yeah. To, so he used yeah. to tie, he would sell the stuff called Corsair, which is the same stuff, right? It was yeah. like woven tubing and he would tie these cool little sand deals and he was such a precise tire, right? So even yeah. though they didn't move particularly well because the stuff is stiff, the, the profile was just so good that they worked great. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So what are you putting in now? What's that? What's that great? So stuff? this is going to be the back of it. And this is um, strung fuzzy fiber, it's called. It adds a ton of bulk um, and body to a fly without adding weight and without adding, it doesn't, it soaks up water, but it sheds it very quickly. The annoyance with this stuff is that you can get batches that are completely awesome like this and frizzy and then you can get a batch that is like somebody didn't use conditioner and it's like straight like a toothbrush and yeah, it's kind of like fish hair sometimes or not fish hair it's super hair sometimes or, like or, that. Um, or even like you know slinky. Slinky fiber and prefer yeah. but like different colors tend to have different consistencies it's very frustrating it's super annoying so um and i obviously there's something that they just can't control in that but Trying to see right. if I can find any flat stuff. But yeah, it's, so it's super annoying. This stuff though, um, if you find one that's super kinky, <laughs> don't like we all like, um, then right. this is going to be the way to go buy them from the shop then and there because you may not find the next batches as kinky as this one is. Um, gotcha. So what I'm going to do on this is I'm going to go ahead and tie it down at the front and it ties are down still, really nice. Are we slim. still behind the eyes? Right now we are in front of the eyes. So okay. what I'm going to do is now I'm gonna tie that down. And it really doesn't matter how crappy of a job you do. So it's gonna end up wrapping and pushing up. That's the only thing I hate about some of these is they all end up, thread ends up going up towards the eye, so. Because that stuff doesn't compress at all. It's plastic hair. So it, it doesn't. Just... Um, and I just always am a sloppy tire when it comes to that too. So it's, I could probably do a cleaner job. Uh, but, but it, I don't. But it did add a lot of volume for not much material. It did, yeah. And I'm going to cut a lot of it off. Um, right. You'll see if I can get away with that. There we go. Um, and then I'll probably, maybe even for fun, because I love pens, add a color to a little bit of a line to it. But what I'm going to do is kind of make it so play it out here a little bit, and then I'm going to trim it. Yeah, but it blends into the profile of the fly great, right? Like, That's the beauty of this stuff um, is that you can really, really. So here's that fly's side profile. From the top, look at how nice and bulky and torpedo-like that is. Um, that would be for us, that would be good at herring or bunker baby shad imitation yeah and you know this um i could probably i'm gonna cut it a touch shorter just because of the i tend to be one of those people that tends to go with a smaller hook than others depending on what you're using it for and then i'll keep trimming it back until i get where i like it um ideally in this case i got a little carried away you probably would want to go one size up in the hook um if you chose but otherwise this would be great and it's really cool with that hint of red i don't know if people can see it well but it actually that'll kind show up as you're fishing it. It kind of glows through the body, right? It does, yeah. That's what's really fun about this stuff is you can really add in um, different colors. And when they get wet, it definitely is gonna show up. Obviously it's gonna show up too, just from the hint on the eyes, but it's pretty cool. And then you could just go in there if you feel like it and remove that rattle 
and replace it if you want, or you could leave it in there, whatever works best for you. That, that would be a, a terrific striper fly. So let me just interrupt for one second. I think we're a few minutes in overtime, but David yeah. and Luyen, um, yeah. what do you guys want to do? Do you want to keep going? Um, yeah, let's can, let's keep going for a little while if it's okay with you, Britta. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I'm just basically adding glue to it and maybe a dot if we're going to turn this into a herring kind of thing or something like that. And that's yeah, it. It looks, it looks so good. And and as Johnny said, man, I, I'll take 10 of those for uh, uh, stripers this, this spring. But we, we did have one, a couple of questions, actually, maybe yeah. a second. And then uh, obviously we're in overtime. So anyone who that's needs fine. To, wants to watch the Oscars, that's fine. But I got to tell you, almost we, we've lost almost nobody. So everyone's riveted here to the screen. Thank you, Britta and Johnny, for the incredible discussion and the beautiful flies. You had a, a question from William about, and this is a material I don't know, called Nayat and asking you to use it, N-A-Y-A-T. Yeah. Yeah. I've used it for sure. Um, I, there's not really a readable source or an easy source for it in um, the US and a lot of places you can get it, but it's not as easy to get as some of the other stuff. It's kind of like snow runner stuff. What, what it's, is it? It's a little harder to find. For those of us who don't know, what is it? I don't know specifically. It's, um, it's, a, it's a, well, it's, there's a bunch of stuff. There's stuff that's sold as Nyad, cashmere goat, Tibetan lamb. Um, it's, you can get it in Canada. What I would say about that stuff is it's very cool. Um, it moves very well, but it is kind of um, tangly and mm -hmm. it does absorb yeah. water. And what I've noticed with synthetics, when you use them in longer lengths, you don't want them to be so, so soft. So for instance, like true yeah. cashmere goat is extremely soft and doesn't have much body. So um, I think that what Britta just did with some plastic pretend stuff, right? that costs $2 um, is probably more effective for that perk for a fly with those dimensions than something like Nyad because that bulk in there is gonna, you're gonna get um, under fur that's gonna absorb some guard hairs. Where it, where it works really nicely is on some steelhead like temple dog type flies and stuff. Oh for yeah, bigger, totally. For this bigger yes. bait fish, I find it's just like a little soggy, yeah. but it is available. Yeah. There is a, you can get it from Skeena Rivers fly yeah. supply, I think, up in BC. Well, and it's funny, it's like, um, you know, like your temple dog and whatnot, where every, it's everyone's guess what exactly it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. And you don't necessarily want to know. No. Nope. For, for a while, Steve Silverio, who's a great fly tire, and you see him at the shows, he was importing Icelandic ponytail, and it was mm -hmm. cool material, but, you know, I didn't, I just didn't get a Jones out of tying with ponytails, so. Exactly, well, yes. I remember, uh, many of you may know, I'm sure, Johnny, you know, uh, our, our good friend Dino Torino, uh, who now of course. Out of Jupiter, but uh, used to be in Staten Island, and, and, and he, would, he would walk the, uh, uh, the um, midtown areas where they had all different colored wigs and he would find all sorts of different colors and material wigs yeah. uh that he would then cut up and splice into he had his wig hair bunker and he would <laughs> go to the weave places but that's what slinky fiber <laughs> is right right yeah uh, totally yeah. i mean so, i used to i used to buy hair extensions and and use mm -hmm. that for my uh for a lot of my flies yeah yeah Cauterizers, hair extensions, and references to suppository. There you have modern fly <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah. Mixed in with a few rattles. You had a question also, uh, Britta, about uh, rods, actually. So uh, Jeffrey, yeah. tell me the best. What six-weight rod you like to use? <laughs> for your you know, right now, I've been using the Sage X. That's been um, a favorite of mine. If I go up in weight at all, then I'm a huge fan of the Maverick. Um, it's a great rod. That's Sage Maverick. I personally, I like nine and a half foot six weights just because it gets you a little bit further up off the rocks behind you when you're casting, mm -hmm. as long as you're kind of um, covered up from the wind, because if you're in the wind, then nine foot is probably better to cut through that better. Um, I tend to carry more line and I tend to enjoy, <laughs> I, um, I joke with myself that I caster bait, if you will, because I like to take way too much time sometimes to, instead of like a point and shoot, I'll I'll do like free falls casts for fun just because I enjoy it. So I tend to like longer belly lines and uh, that X is pretty rad with longer belly lines casting um, and carrying a lot of lines. So that's my pick. If you like super fast rods, then like the Salt HD is the other one I carry around with me for people that want to fish like an outbound short or something. 
So let's let's uh, love to see how you sort of finish that fly. Um, uh, you I'm know. not doing too much to it. Don't worry. I'm just yeah, going to no, add a couple no. spots to make it look more Love like a spots. stab that'll, kind of thing. That would be awesome. And folks, yeah. you know, feel free to ask any other questions you have as we finish up here. But I mean, uh, these are incredible, incredible ties. Thank you so much for... I, got, uh, I have a question I'm, about that. I, I'm I doing that flat. I'm doing the flat wing. I can't wait to, I can't wait to tie a few of those for the spring. I'm, nice. I'm that. Yeah. Nice. So Britta, you were talking about yeah, using yeah. this fly for redfish, right? So, oh, so yeah. on a on a like in the Everglades, that would be a huge fly to throw for redfish. So, are you talking about like Louisiana marsh type redfish? Yeah. So, like the clickbait is a really good one for the marsh. Um, the one I did for Rio Dispository, that one hammers fish in Texas on red, right. for redfish, um, and. I know that it works well in Florida, like Panhandle for redfish. Um, I did uh, a fly called the Hopedale crab for Rio. And that one, if you were to tie some of those up and add a little rattle to that, I bet that would hammer fish even more for the big bull reds. But yeah, any of this stuff, um, I would generally use this for redfish. I'd probably throw it. Um, you could tie it with a regular hook and instead, if you want, do a bead or you could just um, not do any, just a glue on eyes, tie something similar for stripers. That would be really easy to cast, actually, if you had a weighted line um, without the lead on it, if you wanted to do that. So that's another option. Yeah, so and you could get real big rattles, too. So I mean, there's we, that, too. When we, a lot of times when fish are on bunker schools, you know, what we call peanut bunker, it could be anywhere or something mm -hmm. with it, it's two inches to six inches. Yeah. Um, it's a wide profile thing, but a lot of times they're near the surface, slipping on the surface, and you don't necessarily want to fly that's that's dive bombing. So an yeah. unweighted version of that fly would have like the perfect profile, and that gray over white is also a great color. Yeah, and um, I would always rather weight the line than weight the fly if I could get away with it. Much but, more fun to fish. Yeah, totally. So, um, so Britta, Johnny, this is this has been truly an incredible evening of of fly tying and I'm like, I'm riveted to the camera, but you know, before we lose our guests, Johnny, if you want to ask Britta any more pointed questions before we move on to, uh, you know, our salutations, that would be great. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, your casting comment, Britta knocked me off my chair. So, you know, I <laughs> that was, that was great. Um, Johnny. Yeah, so Britta, just just one question. It's less of a tying question. You had been a guide. You'd been, um, you know, working in a shop. So, what what led you to go to work for one of the manufacturers? Because I always find there's usually like a divide, right? Like there's the people who are kind of on the retail side, and then the people who are on kind of the manufacturing side. How did you end up at Rio? Um. So. I started when I realized that I was um, wanting to leave my first husband. Um, I realized very quickly I would need to have a good job as opposed to guiding because it's a little bit less stable sometimes. So I started posting a fly a day on Instagram. And that is what helped a lot um, because at that point then at the time our VP of sales um, <laughs> stalked me from Sage. Um, and he reached out to get me to come over. I didn't realize it, um, but he was asking to have me come in as a technical specialist for Sage. So whenever right. someone would call with like a technical question, I'd be the one to answer how many grains per foot of her in this spay line head and things like that. Um, and well, it turned out that they had already hired Patrick Kilby, who used to manage the fly um, program with Idlewild back in the day. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. So they had already hired him on and he was working in repairs. And they had the intention the whole time, I guess, of taking the two of us and putting us, having us start flies for Rio. Um, and we didn't know it. So both of us were just plugging away. And then six, eight months in, they were like, oh, just kidding. We're actually pulling you out and we're putting you over into R&D. And we're going to have you and Patrick head the whole flies program. And we're going to put it under the Rio umbrella. So I'm still in the office and in the building at Sage on Bainbridge. But in reality, I technically work for Rio. Wow. What's so interesting about that is, is that, you know, um, there are, I can't think of another one of the sort of big tackle manufacturers, like who makes rods and reels and lines mm -hmm. that got into the fly business. So that's kind of an unusual marriage, right? Um, mm -hmm. And you, so you guys yeah. pretty much started that whole program. What, what year did it start? 
started in 2017 and we started off by picking every single fly that wasn't already taken by a signature with another company. Um, and then we, from there, we realized the buckets that we had to fill that we couldn't use. We didn't want to take any of the signature patterns and copy stuff from other people. So then we had to um, create our own. So up until two years ago, all the signature, the Rios that say Rios in front of them, all of those were designed by either Patrick or I. So the two of us designed many, Which is amazing, probably that's hundreds a pretty big, of SKUs. Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty big catalog of bugs. You know, that's yeah. amazing. And Britta, I, I mean, I'm so impressed by, you know, all of this and our viewers tonight um, are in, I know, I know for one, I'm going to continue to follow you in social media and, and I hope everybody else does. And tonight was such an incredible evening of fly tying uh, with you and, 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 you know, having Johnny being one of your influences, he's one of mine too. And, and yeah. Johnny and I are always talking about flies. Um, um, I, I need to throw out a couple of thanks really quickly. Um, our, our planning group, uh, I really want to thank Tom and Clay. You guys, without you guys, Lou and I couldn't do this. And I'm going to do a shameless plug for Lou, um, which is an amazing app Lou's developed called Got One. And if you guys haven't downloaded it yet, um, you really owe it to yourself to do it. It's basically an electronic, there, we're going to put it up. It's basically an electronic uh, log that is only shared if you choose to. Um, it's going to be, you know, it's embedded in your phone, in the cloud, but um, it's yours and yours to keep for yourself. Um, Britta, Johnny, uh, I can't thank you guys enough. Johnny, your interview skills, uh, I, I just bow to your greatness in this tonight. Um, I want everybody to remember, you can see tonight's broadcast on our YouTube channel. Feel free to go to mastersofthefly.com where you can find uh, all this stuff laid out for you. Uh, and um, we are going to have a great session in a couple of weeks with, with um, Ted Williams and Steve Ramirez. I'm very excited for that. Britta, I hope you tune in for that because they're a couple of really incredible writers and good friends. Awesome. Yep. Uh, and thank, yeah, thank you, Dave. And thank you both of you for an incredible evening. And just again, just to, so everyone knows, so Britta, if folks want to follow you, uh, what's the best way to do it? Is it on Instagram? Yeah, it's on Instagram. It would be cfly907. Okay. And Johnny, I, is it Instagram for you too? I know you're, you're, sorry, we didn't put you up on the slide. We should have. Where, where should people look to follow you? I'm like Britta. I, um, I uh, will post on Instagram under Johnny Z King because my middle initial is Z. Um, and it's J O N Y Z King. Yep. One. Yep. Uh, yep. Great. Yeah. And Johnny's ties obviously are just legendary as well. So please, um, you know, follow them, like their stuff. Um, make sure we put the American Saltwater Guides Association link up here. Um, as most of you know, who, who have been on the show before, we have a special program with ASGA um, to support um, the tagging of false albacore here in the Northeast. Really, really cool, exciting project. Um, this is an opportunity, the link here is an opportunity for you to, to contribute and, and sponsor and get a, some really cool swag um, indicating that you're, you're a supporter of that program. And David, thanks for the shout out for, you know, um, for all of you, again, uh, who've heard this before, I apologize, but for those of you who are new, new to it, I, I've built this app called Got One, which is a, um, you know, a, a phone, mobile phone based way to log your catches and get data insights about, uh, about the fish that you catch and, and uh, would love to get your feedback. It's totally free um, and it supports the work of our conservation uh, friends and our, our fishery scientists um so thank you again uh yeah. johnny and britta and everyone else for an unbelievable evening it was really it was oh evening. i just want to say one thing if you want this <laughs> if you want that i gotta keep doing this if you want this just email me and lou we will send you one and uh if you haven't seen it yet um we posted a little video of me and johnny uh fly fishing last summer for striped bass and it's a fun little video. I can't remember the runtime. It's about seven to 10 minutes, but uh, 
you get to hear Johnny and I discussing fly patterns and being frustrated by uh, by big stripers and uh, bluefish. So um, on you know, YouTube, just look for Masters of the Fly and please like and subscribe. Absolutely. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. And until next time. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, guys. Thanks everybody.